I went to Iowa because this uh, massive egg laying farm was shutting down. Um, I mean, this was buildings as big as football fields. Mm. And I was going in with the the farmer's uh, permission to take some egg laying hens to the farm. Okay. Um, they were in something called battery cages where there were in a, uh, a cage, literally no larger than uh, a piece of paper. Oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. Five birds to a cage. What? Yeah. Unbelievable. All right, guys, I'm excited to share this episode with you. I had Dan McKernan of the Barn Sanctuary on with me, and we discuss everything from road trips to um, an in-depth look at the farming industry, the good, the bad. Uh, It's a great conversation, vegan to carnivore. I'm really excited to share it with you. Let's get started. Dan. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) This is going to be fun. Uh, So you are an author. And you run a sanctuary and you have a television show. Yeah. But I got to say, I'm disappointed. And the reason I'm disappointed is you didn't bring a cow with you today. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, sh- I should. Uh, Did uh, we write that into the agreement that you were? Yeah. Yeah. I should have looked for any uh, cows needing a home in this area. Yeah. So and I'm going to have yeah. to take that up with your people when we're done. Okay. okay. That's okay. No. Yeah. I, I can deliver a cow to you. I know. So let's talk about that because you, you, I'll just, I got to hear the story about, or, or more to the story. Because on social media, you highlighted a road trip with a cow. Yeah. Super so, casual. Yeah. That, is that a normal thing in your world? You know, not really. Um, <laughs> I think you'd appreciate this because it was kind of like a van life moment. Okay. Um, I don't know why I did quotations van life because you're an overlander and that's totally something different. And so I apologize to all overlander people. Sorry. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I spent two weeks in a van, you know, a Dodge ProMaster 1500 with a cow. Built for transporting cattle? No, not at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it was a blank slate. (laughs) Okay. Um, and I literally slept in the, in the van for two weeks, uh, with Mike the cow, who's blind now. Uh, But yeah, he was losing his eyesight. And basically, the only doctor willing to try to save his eyesight was located out in Pasadena, California. Okay. So So anyone would. So you just thought, I'm just going to do this. You can't let Mike go blind. Sadly, the surgery didn't work out. Ah, okay. But uh, I was able to take him to Mount Rushmore, which was very comical. Took him to Malibu, got kicked off by the cops. So. Wait, I got. I we got to hear this story. So you just brought a cow out onto the sand in Malibu. Yeah. Why, why wasn't I there for this? Yes. This is amazing. I know. So after his surgery in Pasadena, uh, he lost his eyesight, and so I wanted to do something that would trigger his senses, mm. like hearing the ocean, like feeling the breeze, and all that stuff. I hope it didn't freak him out, uh, but I his did. Scarred for life. Yeah, I know. I took him to Point Doom uh, in Malibu. Brought him out on the beach. Really funny is that this Porsche pulled up and was just like, that's the biggest cow, or I mean, dog I've ever seen. And it was Gary Busey. Okay. <laughs> of all people. <laughs> and I was just like, hey, man, thanks. And he just drove off. And I was just like, yeah, he would live in Malibu. Um, yeah, that's right. But then, uh, you know, the lifeguards came, uh, took a photo. But then the sheriffs came and they're like, you got to get off. The they beach. didn't take a photo. We don't even allow dogs on this beach. And... Then they said, could we take a photo first? And yeah, of course they did. So, dude, there's why not? No dogs, it doesn't say cow. Yeah. I mean, legally, I could have probably said something. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, what was the issue with it? I mean, I guess let's let's tell your full story. I mean, you run an animal rescue or farm animal rescue. So, what was his specific story? So, uh, a farmer that was about an hour north of my farm in Chelsea, Michigan, 
Um, basically, Mike had some swollen joints, mm -hmm. and I didn't know anything about his eyes at that time. I went and picked up Mike, and the farmer was just like, oh, yeah, he's got these crystals in his eyes. And the guy was older, and I was just like, you mean cataracts? And I'm pretty sure the old guy had some, like, fog in his eyes, too. <laughs> but uh, basically, when I took him to Michigan State University, the doctor, an ophthalmologist, because we only get the experts. <laughs> and it was just basically, he's totally blind in one eye and his retina is detached in the other. Okay. He's going to lose his eyesight in a couple of weeks. And I was like, dang, that stinks. Well, can you do anything? And they're like, no, we can't. I was like, well, what about for like a horse mm. or a person, dog and cat? He's like, oh, we'd simply reattach the retina. And I was just like, huh. Uh, do you think uh, you could try that? And he's like, we just don't have the equipment for it. Okay. And so I did like a public announcement and literally the only person was in Pasadena, California. Literally the only person. So, uh, yeah. So road trip it was. Road trip. When it comes to like a, a livestock animal, I know you mentioned a horse and obviously there's lots of money in oh, yeah. show horses and race horses and all that. So people spend a lot of money on repairing uh, yeah. things but is it I'm, I'm assuming it's just not common for, oh, it's definitely uncommon for, for for livestock to receive this type of yeah care. especially going up to like uh, michigan state university where it's a large agriculture school mm -hmm. they just don't get why i spend about thirty thousand dollars on right. a cow <laughs> yeah it just doesn't make sense because right. the value of the cow is just not worth it but i do explain to them that you know i see them in a different way mm -hmm. they're kind of like my companion animal like they're a pet i see them as an individual and so they've uh it's been a growing relationship should right I say. where are you located uh barn sanctuary is located in chelsea michigan okay so it's considered southeastern michigan right outside ann arbor okay and is this is your personal farm that you just turned into decided this is what you're going to do as far as uh, no, you know, it was a family farm. Okay. Uh, so this farm has been in my family for over 140 years. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. So my, you grew up there? Uh, my dad grew up there. My grandma was actually born in the house. Oh, I crazy. only lived there from like when I was born to when I was two. Okay. And I moved around the United States, but I always came back home for winter and summer vacation okay. to visit the grandparents. Yeah. So it was, it was, a fa that's really cool. So that's, but where, so... Yeah, right. Yeah. F like a, an agricultural <laughs> sorry. So it was like a yeah, yeah, no, no. It was a, a hobby farm. Um so oh, okay. you know, explain a hobby farm to me. So a hobby farm's a very uh local, local, local. It's not thousands of animals or anything like All that. Right. It's kinda like a homestead. Okay. Um, self sufficient, uh, but also for the local community as well. Uh my grandparents were huge on like dinner parties and socializing, so they would have uh you oh, know that's cool. Yeah, they would have their uh, their animals on the farm. But for about like 30 or 40 years, uh, it was just sitting there and dwindling. It was kind of like your classic barn slowly tipping over right. type situation. Gotcha. So how many acres are you working with for your current setup? Uh, current setup is about 70 acres. Okay. That's not nothing. No, it's it's quite a bit. <laughs> and a it was good negatives. blank slate. Thank you, Dad. Um, but uh, yeah. About like, uh, how should I say, 45, so if I can do math correctly, 20, 30, 25, 25 acres is wetland. Okay. Which is beautiful because we get beautiful cranes that swoop in and wildlife that come in. It's so. got to be good for the habitat too if you're trying to kind of create sure. an environment that's specific to yeah. just... I love all animals. You can tell. That's yeah, kinda, yeah. It must be a, that's got to be a requirement cool. for what you do. For sure. <laughs> so, but you weren't always on the farm. So when was the transition point for you to take over, move on to the farm? Yeah. What was that like? Uh, so I was basically living in Austin, Texas at the time, yeah. working in technology. Okay. Uh, I was a computer developer and uh, user experience designer. I did. I basically was the yes man for tech startups. I figure out how to get stuff done. Okay. Um, and I was working in my single person office at a WeWork, uh, working remotely. And I was just like, I see what my future is. Uh, and it's just coding and working on a computer. And then my dad gave me a call and he asked, what should we do with the family farm? And, you know, he asked all my siblings. They didn't really come up with anything except for like my twin brother that thought I should sell it to like a big corporation or something like that and sell out. I was just like, dude, yeah, grandma would be proud. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I was, uh, I just got done finishing a book called uh, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life and uh, by Gene Bauer. It's a great book. Hmm. And at that time, I actually uh, just went plant-based. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was living with my partner at the time. I remember uh, she sat me down 
at, at dinner in Austin. I remember exactly what I was eating, so it kind of makes me feel a little uncomfortable every time I tell this. Um, but uh, she's like, Dan, I'm going vegan. And I was just like, yeah, all right. We live together and I'm scared of you. Like, why would I try it? Like, why not? Um, and so we would cook a lot and I slowly became, you know, just eating veggies all the time and uh, learning about how really cool farm animals are. That makes, um, while well, I'm not vegan. Um, but totally that, okay. That, <laughs> Well, good. Yeah. <laughs> the, but I do understand. I mean, it's. I think you're really um, with what kind of your narrative is with the with the sanctuary and kind of, I don't know, just your take on livestock and farm animals mm -hmm. and your relationship with them. It makes sense. I mean, you're really. Yeah. This is something that you're passionate about. These are relationships that you value, and therefore, this is the life that you're living. So, I, I, when I learned that about you, I was like, well, that that kind of makes sense. Um, not totally off base. I do think that commercial farming in uh, America specifically is oh. wild and not in a good way. Um, so it's pretty unbelievable. I I understand when I talk to individuals who have made that switch. It's like sometimes you hear these these farming stories or or just understanding how it it comes to our plate is like that's not food anymore. That's not the food that you're perceiving it to be. Yeah, exactly. Um, nor is it the conditions that you would want something to come to you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I, that's how, like, uh, I have something in common with our small farmers, local family ran farms. You know, it's just a couple of weeks ago, I was purchasing some hay from a, a farmer, a new farmer uh, that I didn't know of, uh, but apparently he knew my grandfather, oh, which I thought was really cool. cool. And uh, we just got talking and like, you know, here I am, a, a vegan and this guy is, uh, he raises livestock and, but he's like, I really like what you're doing over there. Mm -hmm. I know we have some uh, differences, but you know, it's, it's, it's tough competing with the corporate farms. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, Hey, we can agree on that, that right there. Like they're, they're not taking care of the animals. Right. They're not taking care of the earth either. And an example is I, right before COVID or right during COVID in the beginning, I went to Iowa because this uh, massive egg laying farm was shutting down. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this was buildings as big as football fields. Mm. And I was going in with the, the farmer's uh, permission to take some egg laying hens to the farm. Okay. Um, they were in something called battery cages where there were in a, uh, a cage, literally no larger than... Uh, a piece of paper. Oh gosh. Yeah, okay. five birds to a cage. What? Yeah, unbelievable. And there were wait five to the piece of paper size. Yeah, five birds mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lay laying eggs, and there were over oh, five hundred thousand hens on this farm. And I can't take five hundred thousand hens. Right. They were at the same time actually uh, putting his workers were putting the rest of the birds in uh, gas chambers. And gassing them at the same exact time because, uh, you know, either it you take care of the problem and or you also you could have these hens just suffer and die right. from starvation or it, who knows what. It was an unbelievable scene. But there are bulldozers full of uh, dead hens. And the fact is that, like, farms shouldn't be that big. Right. You know, we shouldn't have that many hens in one massive building. Mm -hmm. um, literally, it is the Henry Ford, you know, uh, process line model, basically. Right. How many Model T cars can you build in a day? The assembly line, the factory. Yeah. That, yeah. And there's an organization called uh, LA Pig Save, where they have weekly like vigils in a way. And there is a... Uh, a slaughterhouse in downtown Los Angeles, literally downtown Los Angeles, <laughs> where 10,000 pigs are processed a day. And they're bringing them in in the middle of the night, processing them. And it is- and Is you this happening in LA? In LA. It's, a, it's I'm not gonna say whose organization. Right, you can but... Google it and you can find it and you can go. I think it's a really great, I always try to go. It's not like they are being combative to the drivers that are transporting the, these pigs. These drivers, need to pay for the food on their family's mm -hmm. table, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's kind of a unique situation where the people recognizing all the pigs coming in in a truck every 15 minutes and the truck leaving every 15 minutes. And these people are giving water to the pigs before they go into mm -hmm. the building. 
Um, and then all the drivers are putting up peace signs to the people doing it. And, and it's like everyone's recognizing that this isn't right. Mm -hmm. But it's these massive corporate farms that have taken control of the smaller farmers and basically how we see our food on our plate mm -hmm. it is um, through advertising and marketing. Um, there's been a huge disconnect of what we put into our body every single day. Awesome. So I think the large corporate farming, we could do better. Uh, for instance, there are plant-based alternatives, but also Memphis Meats, they're doing lab-grown meat, cultured meat, which I know a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, it's grown in a lab, but there's no antibiotics mm -hmm. in this meat. Think about it. It's going to taste that much better uh, and it didn't have to have poop coming out of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's literally ground. It's the same exact thing, more pure. Um, and so they're, they're working on solutions on to make that accessible for people. So, but do you think, like you said, like about maybe just rethinking how we eat as well? Cause I know you and I differ as far as how, like mm -hmm. when we sit down to a meal or, or, or what is what we want to participate in. Everyone knows what my opinion is, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's like, you know, don't harm animals, but you know, if we can find common ground, mm -hmm. I think that is what we can do better. Um, you know, is, you know, don't do this massive corporate farming, but right. purchase local, mm -hmm. uh, get, get the ball rolling, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, eat vegetarian one day a month. You know, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people are eating a lot of uh, bad food. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the American diet, you know, we're I think we're the most obese uh, country in the, in yeah. the world. Um, so it's it's just start eating healthy um, and, you know, just include some veggies in your diet. <laughs> Just, 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 just like what, you know, plate, my parents have been telling me since I've been yeah. a baby. Well, I think it's just, it's a respect <laughs> thing. I think we, um, uh, we can move on after this, but I think the, the respecting what we're putting in our body and therefore respecting the animal, I think as mm -hmm. long as I don't really care where, where you fall on that. It's just like, I think that, but that respect has to be important or mm -hmm. a part of that decision-making. Yeah. Um, think and then I can it. get on board. Yeah. yeah. Cause we just don't, we don't put a lot of thought into things mm -hmm. anymore. We're busy people. We are self-imposed business people i'm just <laughs> very <busy>. true <laughs> um okay so you took over the farm and how long maybe you said this but when did you take over the farm uh back in 2016. okay and was it when you took it was it i'm gonna make a sanctuary or was it oh without a doubt it was okay. uh so my dad uh is currently living on the property um i don't want to live with my dad at 33 years old either i get that question a lot do you live with your dad at 33 it's like no no not at all um, 75 acres or so yeah yeah and so basically my dad and i started it you know okay. uh, i was actually working for about a year flying every two weeks from austin texas up to michigan okay. to like help out the farm like we had a we had to do a lot of construction we had no fencing infrastructure mm -hmm. the barn was falling apart we had to clean that out and so uh, it was quite a bit of work before we really were able to rescue our first animals and what was your first animal Two cows. Two cows. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cora and Henry, and Cora, Cora was awesome. I'm already a fan of Henry. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, yeah. He's our tallest boy. <laughs> he's over six feet. Oh, at dang. The spine. Dang. Yeah. They're so like dinosaurs. I know you said you had been doing some research, read that book that kind of had mm -hmm. changed uh, or opened your eyes to yeah. just a, a different world. Um, how how does one go about rescuing farm animals? Do you just like become a part of the community and find out where there's a need, or do you? Oh, the internet and Is social media. Internet? Okay. Uh, you know, before I even started uh, rescuing farm animals and before my dad even said yes to le letting us use the land, uh, he was like, you got to show me that you can pay for the feed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started a little like fundraising campaign of like, be a founding donor of Barn Sanctuary for 25 bucks. And I literally uh, tweeted that out on Twitter. <laughs> I uh, did so. I just spammed the world, and people actually donated. That's it was awesome. unbelievable. So then the local community started like writing about us in the newspaper, okay. and so phone calls came in about uh, farm animals in need. And do you think? Because I, I would assume that a lot of these animals get destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially if you're on a uh, a commercial yeah ranch or it, something that's they're the, down. for profit. Yeah, they usually just um, eliminate. Yeah. Um, sounded weird to say. I know. I was trying to figure um, out what the like appropriate word for that would be. But I mean, they end up just put down, put, the okay, putting them down. Yeah, that's um, 
so do you, I think I guess when given a choice, would they re- they would reach out to you and be yes. like, "Hey, surrender the okay. animal." Okay, um, you <laughs> all the terminology. It sounds weird. To... <laughs> well, it's uh, for instance, like we don't purchase animals, right? Um, and so uh, it's a it is a surrender. The the local farmer, or usually it's someone that knows that farmer, and they can't pay the vet bills, mm-hmm. um, or the the animals just kind of like not necessary, or they don't need the animal, and you know, there's that farmer has a good heart mm-hmm. and was like, can you take in this animal? And that's what happened with Mike, the blind cow. He's he surrendered him to us. Yeah. You know, we're unable to take in every farm animal. Uh, then I turn into a hoarding case. How heartbreaking is that? Anything? Every day I have to say no. Yeah, I get tough. phone calls every day. And uh, most common are like roosters and pop belly pigs. Um, but uh, I always try to find them homes by okay. uh you know, researching other uh, organizations. I always tell people like, there is a farm animal sanctuary in your backyard. You just don't know it. Just Google it. Okay. So you have a a television show. Yeah. So this is Gnarly. crazy. So when this happened, I want, well, okay. You tell me when this happened. Yeah, it was, yeah, early, yeah. It was 2020 or you were filming it before It aired that. in 2020. Okay. Uh, I was reached out. So basically when I first started the sanctuary, I haven't spent much time with farm animals. Um, I did do my research and ask other sanctuaries how to take care of these animals. I hired people that knew how to take care of uh, rescued farm animals. So, but a lot of the time I'd just be hanging out with the farm animals in the pasture, just kicking it. Um, so really the camera should have been there in like 2016. They should have. And just watching the chaos. Yeah. But, okay. The fine. amount of selfies I took, it was unreal. Oh. And uh, I basically, Cora, our first rescue when she was a calf, I, we, you know, I was just kind of mocking her as she was eating and chewing on uh you know, grass. And all of a sudden she laid her head on my shoulder and I was just like, what? I didn't know cows could like kick it and show affection Mm -hmm. and love. And so I shared that on the internet and it kind of just went viral. And then the Dodo did a, uh, a video, you know, like, uh, this guy left his eight to five job, has no idea what he's doing to rescue (laughs) farm animals. It's me. Uh, I do know what I was doing. Thanks for adding that clickbait, whatever. Um, (laughs) and then, uh, that got like 30 million views mm. and a bunch of production companies reached out and I interviewed quite a bit of them. Awesome. And yeah. And settled on one at High Noon Entertainment okay. uh, out of Denver. And then um, they pitched us to networks and, you know, it was going back and forth between Nat Geo and Animal Planet. I think Animal Planet had a bigger budget. And so, yeah, that was back in 2018. Okay. And then it was another life. Yeah, and then we started production in early 2019, Okay. and it aired April 2020. Okay, that was a fun year. It was fun. Great time to launch content, though. Yeah, COVID, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, COVID I mean, just lining. started. Everyone's at home, though. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, COVID was back. Sorry, <laughs> um, but it's a good time because everyone's home. No, I mean, it, it, <laughs> as far as content, it was the time that that was yeah. consumed at an alarming rate. So. We got a lot of messages. Uh, you know, it was like the brightness to their day mm. and stuff like that. So it, it was great. Like it's a great family f- show. It's funny. It's heartfelt. You'll pretty much laugh and cry. It's, it's hilarious. And then my twin brother's on it. He was a total idiot. Oh, okay. So your brother's a part of this. Yeah. He's yeah. Did you get the part where I said he was an idiot? Uh, we can repeat that if you okay. need to. Chris, <laughs> you're an idiot, dude. So has he always um, been a part of the story? No, I mean, he's just my twin brother and no, he wasn't. He was living in California at the time. Okay. But, uh, you know, to button this up into a good TV show, they loved the family component. And so I was like, I got to have Chris on the farm because it's going to be hilarious. Oh, Because he has no idea where to walk. He wears his Converse on the farm and gets stepped on by Mike. Literally, it's on camera. It's hilarious. So it's it's pretty fun. And we have such a sarcastic banter. Mm. So it, it was... Oh, by the way, I convinced him that... Uh, there was such thing as hug therapy for roosters. And so he spent the entire season trying to pick up a rooster. And and you can do it, obviously, but uh, roosters don't like it that much. It's so funny. And I remember the producer was just like, Dan, I don't know if we're going to be able to include this in the show because he's just not picking up the rooster. Oh, God. And he finally then picked up the rooster. And so there was a lot of like in the moment things that was hilarious. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was honestly just to like add con or not add content, add um, 
a storyline to the yeah. show you knew was going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and it was actually really cool because Chris was just like the viewers. They were new yeah. to the concept of a farm animal rescue. Awesome. And so throughout the season, Chris grew in his knowledge of like these farm animals in need. And he actually like really liked it and appreciated yeah. it. And That's so, a real authentic. Uh, yeah. And I think that was that was brilliant to bring somebody on with that perspective. For then, sure. Yeah, everyone got to kind of identify with that. What a, what a time to be doing, like, the sanctuary thing. Because I was – we were kind of chatting about your story prior to this, and I was thinking, like, if you were to have a sanctuary, you know, 10, 15 years ago, before we were all so immersed on the Internet, mm -hmm. um, maybe you could make a stand with a, a decent website and, like, get – Yeah. Some, but there really wasn't the connectivity that we have today. No. And I loved – because, I mean, my first – exposure to you was definitely <laughs> watching a live, I think maybe on TikTok or Instagram, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure which one it was, but, and I realized what you were doing and I was like, oh, cause I know there's a, there's a financial thing. And then there's also an exposure thing that yeah. attached to lives and, and these ways that we're able to monetize them. But you were just on there in a stall with a cow Mike. hanging out and just talking to the camera, talking to Mike, talking to the Man. camera, answering yeah. questions. And I was like, this is fascinating because I've I've never seen no one's ever seen it. It was crazy. Before. I remember um I so the first time I started going live was like in April of this past year and oh it's relatively new though. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it was and I, I think TikTok wasn't expecting it either. Uh, because I was getting like 12,000 people watching. I was like, "Dang." And you know, TikTok they take 50% of revenue, which is insane. Oh, and I so I always that. push people to go to the, you know, link in my bio and our merchandise sales like quadrupled for the, the sanctuary. Our donations were increasing. And um, then TikTok hit me up mm. and I had a meeting with them. And after that, I was I was getting lesser viewers. <laughs> I think I broke their algorithm for a second because we were getting so many, so many viewers is unreal. But they want me to continue going live because it's wholesome content. TikTok can be a really weird place. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> so they really uh, like the uh, Dan hanging out with Mike the cow in the barn answering questions. Well, live. I, I would. I mean, that makes sense. Someone yeah. at least has a is thinking at that, you know, that that everyone loves that. What is yeah. what could be what could be know, weird right? about this? And I think you I mean, having the them be affectionate with you and show us that, you know, these aren't I mean, honestly, I think the majority of us that live in cities and don't get out to to actual yeah. farms, a petting zoo is the closest thing you've totally. ever been to. And, you know, that's, you know, the, the holidays or whatever. Picking yeah. out your pumpkin and you go to the petting zoo. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as I don't even know what the background of those stories, those animals are, but like that's a not that everyone knows that's an artificial interaction with. It is animal. an artificial. Those the the animals there, are, you know, they're kind of like props, right? Exactly. Yeah, and so so we offer tours at Barn Sanctuary oh, every do. weekend and private tours throughout the year. And so uh, yeah, you gotta go. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's cool. Um, most of the private tours are with my dad too, so it's pretty cool. Oh, you can hear cool. some like low key stories about me um but uh so petting zoos you know uh, you condition them to come up to you with treats right and so i uh, we try to educate people when they come out to the sanctuary and you get to hang out with the animals for sure but you can't give them treats because we treat them as individuals sometimes mike the cow might be having a bad day and he doesn't want to see it he cannot see, so he does not want to hear or smell anyone. <laughs> and so he people just well, let him be. <laughs> yeah, no, I laugh all the time. I make fun of him all the time. He makes fun of me, too. Okay. That's cool. Uh, he drools on me sometimes. Um, but, uh, yeah, the animals are going to come up to you because they want to. Right. And most of the time they do because we have a great volunteer program. We have a great staff. And they're very uh, in tune with uh, humans, should I say. So it's pretty cool. That environment seems like heaven. But... I got to imagine that it's not always. Yeah, totally. Great. You know, I wanted to leave. This guy left his tech job of being behind a computer to uh, rescue farm animals, period. That sounds amazing, right? Mm, that's Had no idea what it was, uh, what it took to start a nonprofit, mm. to hire people, to manage people, HR. And, you know, just like a business for, uh, you know, for profit business, like when the market's doing really bad. Mm. People to donate a lot less, and we've got about 17 employees at our sanctuary, and so um, you know, 
not just the over 100 animals we have at our rescue, there's 17 people that we need to take care of as well, right. you know, and pay them that are taking care of the animals. We administer over 100 medications a day to our residents there. And it's it's pretty insane. Our our medical bills last year was over a hundred. I know you you <laughs> laugh <laughs> now, <laughs> but then your jaw's gonna drop. It was over one hundred thirty thousand. Mm, and crazy. yeah, so operating uh, a nonprofit is pretty hard. It's just because you know that it's sometimes you're going month to month, mm -hmm. paycheck to paycheck, making sure you cover costs and everything. So. And so when you do the lives through TikTok, kind of to full circle that, uh, when you do that, th I mean, that stuff, whatever monetary value you're able to get from those, goes to the that goes to the sanctuary. Yeah. Yes. But so, I always say, because they take 50%, like Facebook donates 100% of transaction fees really? to the nonprofit. Unbelievable. And then just like credit card processors and stuff like that, they take a, a percentage like Square or something like that. Right. But Facebook gives 100% of your donation. Huh. Yeah. They're not, they're not really talked about very favorably right now, so that's that's great. <laughs> yeah, Mark 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 Zuck, man, you know, he's all about that meta. I, everyone's a, wants to go after social media right now. I mean, myself included. I've definitely fallen into that. But it's it's such a, a wild landscape for everything. Yeah. It, there's not a lot of rules. I mean, there's a lot of like figuring it out as you go and then you find out you're not allowed to do that anymore and you got to get a pivot and it's like, Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. You gotta follow rules. And then, especially with TikTok right now, owned by China. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the meeting I had and the NDA I had to sign definitely had a China address mm. and was owned by a company I had no idea. It was unbelievable. It's yeah. a little weird. It is and weird. And so, uh, it, it's uh, especially when it's like out of country mm -hmm. and you know they're taking like 50%. You always wonder if there's like a hidden agenda there. And it's all about data. They just want data. Yeah. I think because we don't know what that hidden, what that agenda, there's got to yeah, be an agenda. There's, we, there's no reason that they wouldn't be in business as they are in yeah. the United States. There's no way unless yeah, there was yeah. something they were coming after. I mean, I agree. I think a lot of it is the data, but it's a strange time. I think yeah, we're just, definitely, it's we're, like the wild west. Yeah, yeah. And we're just being exposed to so much more information. I think that's a product of Ugh. the internet. I don't think, yeah. I don't know if it's, this is new information or are we just aware of it now? Like, yeah. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I, it, it does make us all a little leery. And TikTok is definitely within the cross within the crosshairs right now for oh everybody. Oh my gosh. I was invited to um, a conference, Best Friends for uh, Best Friends Animal Society. I don't okay. know if you've heard of them. Great dog and cat rescue. Um, very large, large organization. Um, invited me to their conference to meet some people. And they introduced me as an influencer. Mm, that's and I was just like, ooh, yeah. No, I'm a... I'm, president and founder of Barn Sanctuary, and I happen to go on TikTok at 10 p.m. at night with Mike the Cow. <laughs> it was always interesting. It's you, pretty gnarly how that is a coin term now. Yeah, That's it's uncomfortable. Cool. I'm the same way, because I don't, I mean, I'm nowhere near what you're doing at, at, by any means, but like, because my, my social media experience was kind of a hobby mm -hmm. that was like, oh, people are entertained by it. Well, that's fine. Like I enjoy doing this. So we'll just create yeah. some stuff and we'll interact and it'll make a great community. And I, I still cringe at the influencer thing. It's like, oh, but, the, but you have to admit like, but it kind of fits. Yeah, like, no, it does. It totally understands. Yeah. But I do but, other things too, <laughs> you know? That's okay. We'll just be quietly Risky confident with that. It's kind um, of a big deal. Yeah. Well, it's just uh, some of the influencers on TikTok that are famous are literally just known for being on TikTok. Scenario. And that's, a, I will put that in the, it's a strange time. Yeah, we'll put that in the strange time. Yeah, category. it's definitely. I don't. I'm concerned at the uh, the lack of life skills that we are like not promoting mm -hmm. to do things other than yeah, be on a social media platform as yeah. like the sole thing. Uh, anyways, I don't think I plan TikTok. on talk, TikTok. It will we'll, we'll <laughs> shelf that and talk about that later. Um, but speaking of the next generation, talk about a segue. Um, yeah. You wrote a children's book. I wrote a children's book. Yes. Okay. So tell me about this. What? 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 Why? Why would you write a children's? You know, book? running a nonprofit, I was looking for other ways to build revenue okay. for the sanctuary rather than just asking for money all the time. Um, and so, yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, I was able to write a kids' book. Um, a publishing company reached out to me. Uh, Harper Collins owns this 
publishing company. And so uh, basically it's called This Farm is a Family and it's about Buttercup, who's one of our newest rescues at the sanctuary. Okay. And she is nervous and scared and has anxiety and she's afraid all the other residents at the sanctuary are going to make fun of her. Okay. And so you can kind of relate it to being a new kid at school mm -hmm. or being coming back to school after, you know, COVID and everything. Mm. And so, and kids are anxious and are stressed out and it's about treating others with compassion. And so all the uh, animals in the book have unique voices and personalities and they're all current residents at my farm. Awesome. Yeah. So it's really cool. I really love it. I love uh, kids really enjoy it too. A little so. time capsule for you too, as far as just yeah. a, a memory of like a snapshot of the farm as it is. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. So. If you could speak to everyone in America, I mean, what I, because you have a unique perspective with your relationship with the animals and then going through the process of rescuing. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably something that many of us don't even understand that how that works. What is like the one thing you would want to convey to the the average person like what do we need to be looking for what do we need to be how can we help yeah yeah, yeah. uh you know i just want people to like personally i would like to say like when you see a herd of cows just don't think it's a herd of cows or you know like a herd of pigs or chickens like each single one of those have different personalities mm. like some of the animals on the farm really just don't like me and i'm like Okay, I don't like you either, you know, like, you know, I'll let you be an individual. Um, and so I, I really encourage people just to see them as individuals. That's why we actually name all the animals uh, human names, usually, uh, because we want people to see them as potentially, uh, you know, a family member named Mike or something like that. And so that's what I really encourage people to see, um, you know, if people are not ready to alter their their diet or anything and i understand and it's like you know just think about eating healthier for yourself and for the planet and then for mike you know like you could just just don't if you eat steak seven days a week and i'm sure some people do just try it six days it'd be better for your health for sure um but uh yeah just you know in moderation i'm trying not, i'm not telling you what to do people <laughs> I'm not telling you what to do. You make your own decisions. I'm all for that. But I'm just here as a resource uh, and sharing positive content. Mm -hmm. If they decide to go down this funnel, you know, and if they, it, they're they like, oh, I care about the environment, they'll learn about the environmental impact of like factory farming. Mm -hmm. um, or if they care about their, their health, they will as well. I'm also, I'm not saying that, you know, <laughs> You're unhealthy if you eat meat. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to say that to people. Um, but you can get, you know, n nutrients from plants as well. Absolutely. Is, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I think, what again. Do you, and oh. what do you think animals eat to get, you know, all the nutrients that are in their meat usually? It's from grass. Really? And, stuff, and plants and beans. Sure. I don't, they don't eat. It's interesting. They don't eat meat. Am I a scientist? No. no. So don't challenge me on that right now. <laughs> No, but, but. I, I think, again, back to that, how we present things and how we, and I, I mean, a huge part of wanting to be, have a podcast and wanting to communicate is because I think while the social media stuff is great sometimes, it does, it's very one-sided or it's very limiting on how we, how we can't engage in true conversation. Yes. Uh, it's just not possible. Yeah. So I love that, like, I want to be able to talk to somebody who has a very different perspective on something. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean I have to walk away from that conversation converted no. and, you know, everything I thought was wrong and now I'm this way. And it's like, no, no, no. but we do out of respect for just our fellow human. Yeah. And we live here together. We could do a, a lot better at listening Absolutely. to people. Um, a funny example is like, I have an older brother. He's great. I love him to death. Uh, he will always have my back. He is a meat eater like no other. He'll say, hey, Dan, come on over, man, right before the game and send me a picture of like baby back ribs on the grill. I'm like, Matt. He's like, oh, crap, my bad, man. Didn't mean to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I still come over and have a beer with them, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like I and so, uh, you know, he's asked me questions and, you know, and he decides to do what he wants with that information. Another example of like trying to like talk to people that have different views and whatnot is like, uh as a nonprofit, you need to have a board of directors and whatnot. And, uh, you know, uh, w one of my uh, board members and another, like they have uh, different political views, mm. you know, 
And I was just like, great, that is awesome because I want a diverse board Absolutely. of directors. I don't want to, you know, leaning any particular way. I want as many diverse opinions as possible. Yeah. And so because that's how we actually make monumental changes, not if uh, one side is dominant over the other. It's like, you know, you got to have people from both sides and in the middle. Totally. So, yeah. yeah. You can't drown out the other side. That's... Exactly. We're not we're not that perfect of individuals. They're individuals too, just like farm animals. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Way to bring that all yeah. back. Together. Yeah, full circle. So I know I wanted to talk specifically, um, I mean, since we've got you here. Yeah, yeah. What is I know when you go on your website, um, and I've seen other sanctuaries do this where there's like a you can donate for hay like for the hay for the season yeah. for like winter season. Oh my gosh, yeah. How much does feed like what do you what do you think average? Um, so just like uh Everything in the United States is increasing in price. Inflation right. is gnarly. Uh, our uh, our feed bills are insane mm. and out of the roof. Like we probably spend close to 150 to 200 bucks a day to feed our pigs, which they don't eat hay. So my bad. But uh, the hay bales um, are increasing in price. We're paying like seven to eight bucks a bale okay. for a small square bale, and we're going through about uh, 15 to 18 a day. All right. And if you don't know anything about Michigan. Winter there is not easy, and it lasts for six months. Right. And so that means six months I can't have the animals out on pasture, uh, which is basically free food for me. Mm. Uh, I don't have to pay for anything. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we spend uh, spend quite a bit. Our, our goal to raise, we wanted to get enough funds for 10,000 bales. Um, and that includes straw because our pigs use straw for bedding. They actually nest, which okay. is really cool. And then we have bags of shaving. Uh, because we clean everyone's stall every single day. Uh, we treat them like, uh, you know, horses. So um, it's quite a bit of money. It's yeah, insane. It adds and up. So if you want to donate a bale of hay, you can do so by donating $7 at barnsanctuary.org. <laughs> Great. I loved it. <laughs> that was perfect. It is amazing how much all that stuff costs, though. So I mean, operationally, like, we are uh, over 100000 a month. I don't doubt it. Uh, at our expenses. It's insane. It's crazy. Well, yeah. I mean, we're, I'm slowly getting exposed to the horse world. Slowly. Yeah. So <laughs> a common question we get, why don't you rescue horses? Um, number of reasons. I don't know anything about horses. There's an argument there. I didn't know anything about farm animals. True. Reason number two, I'm scared of horse people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> horse owners are terrifying. Well, I thought they were all I, I, can, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> They're cool horse owners. And, and it's not all The cool them. horse it's owners know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, there's some cray-cray. Well, it, I, I'm laughing because the, the trend in social media – gosh, why do I keep talking about social media? But the trend is like this uh, new exposure to farm life. And yeah. and the equestrian lane has like exploded. All of a sudden, like my feet – and I'm probably perpetuating it. But I laugh because it's like – did we just discover that people ride horses? Like the way. <laughs> no, it's Yellowstone. That's what it's it is. The TV That's, show. You're right. You're right. Everyone's like, I want to be a cattle rancher. You know, it's so funny. Um, you know, so people kind of dress the same sometimes as the people in Yellowstone. And I was just like, oh, you you have a farm? And they're like, oh, no, man. I live in Simi Valley, California. And I was just like, you're a Simi Valley bro, aren't you? <laughs> and you're dressing up as if you're. Uh, you know, on the TV show Yellowstone. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, that's all. We had, Ant <laughs> Ant we had a few podcasts ago. We had Antonio and he is a, um, has a horse ranch in Texas. Okay, cool. And, uh, but he, uh, he's a, a black man and he has oh, that's this. so cool. Like he's. Being black. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it, but we were, we were touched on the fact that like there is a, um, like a, a stereotype that gets attached to, oh my gosh, to yeah. like the the look and the styles and stuff like that. And so he was kind of talking about there's this like urban cowboy look that's yeah. come out. And so, but he's it was kind of given us the um, I don't know the information on how to decipher who's well, there's, who. Yeah, there's um, you know, the black community have started like I'm sure they've been horseback riding a lot, and but you know there are a number of nonprofits that are bringing horseback riding into the cities. Yes. Uh, for, you know, uh, certain communities that wouldn't get close to, you know, horses. And I think it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And so the urban cowboy is really cool. Uh, what was that one film that just came out? Uh, Jordan Peele, he did a movie called Nope. And, okay. you know, there's a lot of uh, black actors and actresses 
uh, riding horses. Okay. And it was really cool. And like, they're good. Writing horses. Well, after having the podcast, I it, it it made me like okay, I'm gonna start digging a little bit further. And there's, I mean, there's there's organizations that are are working with like urban youth and bringing them out to ranches. Yeah. And then there are there's a ton of ranches and communities and uh, rodeos specific yeah. too. And I was like, wow, this is just something that I was just never exposed to. Yeah. Uh, it's just again, it's it's a what a time to be alive, right? Uh, <laughs> I know. Have I seen the movie? Nope. I'm scared of scary movies. It's a scary movie. It's oh, a it's a film. scary. Oh, I didn't know. He's really good at horror films in case you don't know. Sorry to interrupt you, but. Oh, yeah, I had no hard. idea. I was thinking this is like a real. It's got twisted. It's mind. a scary movie with they're on a horseback. Dude, yeah. Yeah. He, now yeah. I have to see it just for curiosity. I know. For the horses. <laughs> just for the horses. Yeah. Okay. So you don't rescue horses though. Okay. Back in 2018, there was a hurricane called Hurricane Florence. Okay. And basically. In North Carolina, there's a lot of uh, agriculture and whatnot and a lot of flood zones. And so I drove straight there and literally uh, was in these floodwater rescue boats trying to save animals. And, you know, yeah. if there was a horse drowning, I'm not saying I wouldn't rescue that horse. I will rescue the horse or any other living being. Um, so... Yeah, horse people. <laughs> Don't get get off my back. You're just not taking them back home and caring. For yeah, them. so... Got it. But there were cases where there was a, a, a deer literally hanging on to oh. a farm roof. Literally, but a roof, and it was just the rafters. There was no shingles or anything, and so we had to go out and park the boat on the roof and pull the deer off. Mm -hmm. I was able to rescue uh, two puppy dogs from a porch. Uh, I mean, these floodwaters were 15 feet up, mm -hmm. 10 square miles unbelievable um and then there are uh, some farm animals some cows that were on a porch were rescued as well and you know for me i was pretty new to the whole rescue game at that time so yeah i wouldn't recommend driving straight into a hurricane like yeah. for instance you know i took my the famous dodge ram 1500 front wheel drive and uh into a hurricane <laughs> and i remember i got in at like 2 a.m and i was going down a road and i was like oh man this is not the right way. And then I turn around and the road is washed out basically. Mm. And I was like, what am I going to do? And so I later drove on someone's front lawn. Um, but I, I got formal training and there's like FEMA training. You can get large right. animal technical rescue. So I really, uh, enjoy doing, uh, you know, natural disaster rescue because I think farm animals don't get rescued that often. I could definitely see that being, well, and we have uh, in California, we have fires, uh, often. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and the really a couple two years ago there was some that just took over at at just pace it, the speed at which they moved mm. was kind of unprecedented and uh, it was scary honestly but there was a lot of footage of and we have a lot of horse ranches and yeah. so not to come back to the horses again but but it was it did kind of shed light on like you, you think about getting like the humans out and you know we see the the news footage of you know the the dogs on the porch and a flood and like in the but I'm like I that moment actually kind of made it clear that what about like all the livestock exactly and you know that they have some instinct but in some cases like a lot of those horses were like boxed in by wildfire yeah. so it was like they didn't they were going to yeah have on to go the, through the flames on these pig farms where there's ten thousand pigs and then there's these uh, manure lagoons where a lot of manure goes and the the, the waste okay they're poop and urine <laughs> but basically that washed into the river everything mm. was with in one and it was disgusting and then there'd be swimming pigs and you know by the way catching a pig is so hard <laughs> episode 10 of saved by the barn you will see that it is brutal um and so yeah they need to find homes uh you know wait because they don't want to be caught or just because they're they probably want to get the heck out of that farm mm. You know, uh, there's a number of times we've rescued uh, farm animals, pigs specifically, that have jumped off transport trucks oh. and they've gotten scraped up. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And so we, I always say they're jumping for freedom, which is great. Yeah. But I mean, I uh, so this is I don't know. so we rescued uh, these two pigs, piglets from Iowa that were actually frozen inside of a, a transport truck. And the person cleaning it out saw these two piglets and um, he kept them in his apartment. Yeah, I know. And we got in contact. I named them Anna and Elsa from Frozen. Oh, cool. 
<laughs> don't know if that's like wrong, but you know, nah, it, works. it was great. It was cute. Connected yeah. with the kids. Um, but yeah, so like Michigan doesn't really get natural disasters. It might just be a Flint water crisis type situation. Mm. But uh, we have a contingency plan if, like, there's a fire that sweeps over, if there's a tornado, and we work with our local county uh, fairgrounds to okay. uh, bring all the animals in there. But when you have, like, 5,000 head of cattle, man, yeah. it's hard. So well, I don't sure, know how they do it. I'm sure some of it's just kind of, like, you can only do so much. I mean, at certain, uh, you yeah, would you can only do so much. You would yeah. hope that responsibly you have something in place. But, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you just do what you can. Mm-hmm. And hopefully their instinct takes over and you can go get them again. It was it. What were this is totally off topic. Go do it. What was it? The hor- was it the last hurricane that came through and they were like tying the like stuff into their manes and stuff and just like letting their horses go and their livestock go. Yeah, like sometimes the best them. option is just to let them go. And you know you don't have to include this part in the podcast and stuff. And it's a little uh, dark and wrong, but like something some of these large there's a massive turkey farm. Um, but they locked the doors when the flood came in because they're considered property. And so their insurance reimbursed them for all. Oh. That. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty brutal, dude. Yeah. That's like but the that's, sad part. That's I, I kind don't of really. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I think that's kind of the side of the the business side of the commercial the business farming side. that yeah. comes in and, and you see the profits become. And I mean, I want to think that like at its core, like when people start these businesses or, or, or get into this, you, they don't see that that way. But when you're okay, if I could put on my business hat and not remember anything I've done the last six and a half years, which is nearly impossible. And you see, you don't see a living individual and you just see like, let's just call it a textbook Mm. and the textbook is ruined from the flood and you got insurance then. Right. You know, or something like that. But yeah, it's pretty. That was really hard to see. That was emotional. Yeah, I saw that. That was bad because when the floodwaters uh, go down, the the doors bust open. Mm. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. Well, and back to that point you made about like we need both sides. We need you know we need business and we need uh, commerce and we need things to make yeah. money so that industry so our economy works. But we also need to hear the other side. Yeah, and it's a it's a blending of those two. It it's is. Like we I am. I want people to make money and make a living and and do all those great things, but we also need to have the other voice. Yeah, and I'm not saying all farm like large oh, farms do not. that because yeah. I I saw a lot of people evacuating their their lives for sure. No, yeah, it's for definitely sure. not. It's, it's just the occasional. Yeah, we're speaking generally. Yes, for sure. 4H, USDA, <laughs> don't come after me. I didn't do. Do anything you need any wrong. other disclaimers that? Um, you start messing with animals, it gets. USDA likes veggies too. It's all agriculture. <laughs> so I guess I wanted to just expand a little bit earlier. You had talked about um, kind of the ways in which you can rescue and or that you rescue animals. Uh, but is there anything that we can do better as a society or as our per- the way we perceive acquiring and then caring for yeah. farm animals in particular? Is there anything, like what is society doing? Yeah. How could we do it better? I, I would say, you know, just like dogs and cats, when someone, uh, you know, for Christmas gets a dog and goes off their emotion and impulses and they can't take care of the dog. And so they have to yeah. now give that dog up to a shelter. Um, that happens a lot uh, for us is like uh, someone specifically like pot belly pigs. Mm-hmm. People see a tiny little micro pig. There's no such thing as a micro pig. Pigs are pigs. <laughs> they get big. They like to eat and they're strong. I don't think tiny little pigs should be inside of a house unless it's built for a pig. <laughs> Aren't they really intelligent too? They so are, you're going to have something that's challenging you. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Pigs are smarter than dogs and a three-year-old child. Yikes. It's unbelievable. Um, but yeah, a lot of our rescues, um, you know, I try to do less of animal like surrenders, like someone made a mistake mm. because there are animals in need that have been involved in a cruelty case or that is at large or loose. Like I just rescued a turkey in East Detroit recently. And so that's right. You were running around Detroit with a net. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Uh, People are staring at me like, who is this guy? Um, But, uh, you know, I would say backyard hens are super popular because people want to have their own eggs at home. And, you know, you know, in a way, it's better than getting it from a large factory farm. 
where there's hundreds of thousands of chickens crammed in small cages, but also like educate yourselves on like, yeah, there's an egg there. And if you don't pick up every single one, every single day, chickens are really good at hiding those eggs. Mm. And guess what? Because your township ordinances says you can have hens, but you can't have a rooster. There's no way knowing you're going to get a rooster. And so like, I, because that's, I get a call about a rooster every single day. And so educate yourself before you look into um, having animals. And that's including cats, dogs, Absolutely. even horses, mm-hmm. um, horse people, whatever. <laughs> you are going to get it from the horse people, I man. Know. <laughs> hey, donate. They have money. <laughs> True. It's expensive to keep a horse, in case anyone's wondering. Yes. that's I, Yeah. I'm that's been kidding. the... I've heard a couple of numbers thrown around and I was like, well, because there's kind of always that little girl dream where you're like, oh, like one day I, would be, I want to own a piece of property and I want to have a horse. And, and a pony. A, well, ponies are mean. I know. Um, I had no idea. But uh, <laughs> back to the question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, uh, we try to really focus on uh, farm animals from uh, the food industry. Okay. And so that they came from a factory farm so that we can educate people. Okay. Like every resident we get, we want them to be an ambassador for their species in a way. And so if we're just getting animal surrenders all the time, it's really hard to uh, tell that story to affect a, a lot of people and a lot of change. And so we want to educate people about these large corporate farms. Um, but there are cases where we do get, you know, a small farm animal surrender because they can't afford vet bills, gotcha. you know, but I, I, I try to believe that every, uh, Every farmer, every individual uh, has a heart in there. And so, you know, you don't have to just put down a, an animal because they're they're wor- technically worthless. Mm. They aren't worthless. Mm-hmm. They got a personality too. Just try to find a, a rescue to take them. So That's awesome. Well, I love what you're doing. I think it's a – well, I think it was an easy understanding to go like, oh, yeah, of course, like, like farm animals – in my mind, my my experience have been like a lovable thing. Like it's like, oh, yeah, there's a great relationship. Uh, getting to like be more focused on where my meat comes from. It makes me a little more engaged in the uh, the families that run them. So mm-hmm. I get to see like how they're caring about every day. She milks the cow twice a day. You know, it's this mm-hmm. whole experience. And with social media, I get to watch it happen. And it's you feel connected to the whole thing. Um, but I think what you're continuing to do is, again, we're just moving at a million miles an hour yeah. as a, as a society. So to kind of have people slow down and like think about yeah these smaller things, the things that get pushed to the side that don't rise to the top as, oh, this is so important in today's society. It's fun to watch you. I don't know. It, and it's it's cute. Yeah. No, it's I enjoyable. Mean, <laughs> I'm trying to stop people in their day-to-day hustle by showing them positive emotions from farm animals. Yeah. Um, and I think that is what my job is uh, because, you know, I'm not trying to dictate what you do do to your do in your life i'm just trying to plant a seed pun intended <laughs> so well done i think i think you <laughs> you accomplished that yeah all right well we got to get you back to the farm yeah i need to get back to the farm it's pretty busy yeah. over there and we're preparing for winter and this is going to be when i uh, say it again if you would like to donate a bale of hay for seven dollars to you mike the cow or even uh you know the donkeys, uh, they actually uh, eat barley straw, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> but please go to barnsanctuary.org slash donate, and you can donate there. Awesome. Well, cool. thanks again for taking your time out. I know you are busy. There's a lot going on, so I appreciate the time. Thank and you. sorry, Mike Glover, we just ran out of time. 